Um, I've been in this job about four or five months when I went to King's Pool in York where DEFRA was doing a refurbishment job on a building and the contractor there um, uh, showed me how from memory it was you know, 95 plus percent of the waste was going to be re reused in some shape or form and, and he said it's, you know, it's not special for us because that's what we do now and there were the charts by the site office showing what the proportions were and there were the various skips. Uh, and so on, and, uh, and the fact is it's becoming much, much more uh, commonplace and frankly it should be uh, the norm. And both landfill levy and landfill bans will act as a very strong encouragement. The second question that you raise, which is about using materials in the appropriate way, well I suppose the question I'd ask back is if it's rosewood mahogany, well who else is after that? How do they, do they know it's available? Are they prepared to come and say, well, please don't dispose of that in this way because I will give you a different sum of money for it because I'm making whatever I'm making. So I suppose it comes back to the point we were discussing uh, earlier. How do you bring together people who've got something which is no longer needed by them together with those who do? And if we can improve the information and the signals about what's available, then you ought to be able to ensure that the material goes for the best use because the market... Uh, in time ought to uh, provide a reasonable price signal that if it's that kind of material it really isn't sensible to burn it in biomass it's sensible to use it for something else but they're not well uh, this, I mean there's quite a few reuse businesses operating I was uh, about five or six months ago I went to an office of furniture manufacturing a ma manufacturer in Yorkshire that was much troubled by the fact that you had big buildings, they cited an example of a university, that was refurbishing the building. And what they were doing was taking all of the tables and all of the chairs, ordering a lot of skips, dumping them in, off they went to landfill. And they thought this was crazy. So they started to provide a service saying, well, if you don't want them, we'll take them off you. Uh, either we can do something with the chipboard, we can take out the various bits, because we might be able to use that on new office furniture. And in microcosm, it was a it was a very good example. They are a commercial business, they make office furniture and sell it, but because they had um, one person who'd arrived who was really committed, uh, the managers thought it was a good idea, and on a small, a modest scale, they were very straight about what they were seeking to do, but it seemed to me that uh, they felt there was sufficient incentive, both for their business and the contribution they wanted to make, to stop, help to stop something that was going on, which is self-evidently uh, crazy. Chucking away things that can be reused. There are also charities. Who and do lots of charities social, social that do the same kind of stuff. Yeah. Right, Jack. Yeah, yeah, just quickly, I mean, uh, I think it's not quite right to describe it as a market failure, is it? Uh, we've got exact, once again, we've got exactly what we asked for. We asked for, um, uh, to, uh, that we, we wanted renewable energy and we decided that uh, wood was a renewable form of energy and we subsidise it and lo and behold, that's where the wood's going. What did we expect exactly? Um, and I think, but of course, that's not actually what we wanted, was it? What we wanted was low carbon, and if we'd valued the carbon that's embedded in goods and services as highly as the carbon we save by using renewable energy to generate energy, then we would have got the right answer in that case, wouldn't we? So I think it's just another cautionary tale to be very careful about what you ask for, because you tend to get it.